Hey, sports fans, it's world champion Andy Gepper, Mike North. Punch this number in your phone right now. If you're driving, pull over. 1-800-808-3419. 1-800-808-3419 for a free pick and info for the premier handicap in sight in the country, Vegas scores at odds.com. It's the only site you'll ever need with expert handicappers like John Anthony, Denny Macklin, Tony Sacco, Ray Monahan, yours truly, and many more. Check out the homepage of Vegas scores at odds.com for a tote board with your buddy. Follow Vegas Scores and Odds on Twitter and dial up 1-800-808-3419. It's 1-800-808-3419. 1-800-808-3419. Or go to VegasScoresAndOdds.com. The following program is distributed by the Bears Bar Room Radio Network. It's presented live over MixLR.com and later disseminated in podcast format on most delivery platforms. It's intended for all audiences. Never before in the history of sports podcast has one show made this promise. Draft on Tap will report on every college prospect pro scouts are looking at for the 2020 NFL Draft. Every one of them. Sanders, smother, chase, young, another big play. Montez second and gold, steps in, caught, touchdown, the third passing touchdown of the first half for Steven Montez. One, there's Johnson, he's got it, touchdown Texas. An open man at the 25, a foot race for the tight end, there's that man again, Albert O with his second score, 47 yards. Draft on Tap with Bears Barroom Draft Analyst Denny Shimon, your host, Ryan Badgley, and featuring some of the most respected draft analysts in the country. Grab a beer. We're about to make history. And making history is what we do on Bears Barroom Radio Network. I'm your host, Ryan Badgley, and welcome to Draft on Tap. We have an exciting show planned for you tonight with Russ Landy joining us live around 8.30. So pop in that mouth guard and let's introduce our Bears Barroom Draft Analyst, Danny Shimon. Danny, how are you tonight? Hey, Badge. I'm doing great, man. Uh, How are you doing tonight? Uh, Doing well, man. Uh, Glad it's Thursday. Looking forward to the week winding down and uh, tuning into some much-needed college football action this weekend without a shadow of a doubt, man. How about you? Yeah, I had another another great weekend last weekend. Uh, I had a little bit of a different view. I was I was at the Caesars uh, Sportsbook in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, watching some of those games out there, and uh, you know uh, just um, watching pretty much like six, seven games at one time. It's a little bit hard to kind of keep focus on all the games, but uh, definitely was definitely an experience I enjoyed. Yeah, I, I've been to Vegas myself, Danny, and it's definitely if it's something people haven't done. I highly recommend it and going and sitting in a sports book um, and being able to watch uh, multiple sports on multiple TVs. It's an amazing experience. And of course, while you're there, you have to make a bet on your favorite sports teams. Well, well, that's the thing is like you're watching the game and all of a sudden you hear a a roar from the other side of the room. You're looking like, oh, what happened? So, you know, know, someone scored and that that put the team at at the necessary points for the uh, the person to to win their bet. So it's kind of it's kind of like, you know, it catches your attention. You know, you're sitting here watching one game. All of a sudden you hear a roar. You look over there and you hear a clap over here. you, You turn back around. So it's definitely an experience. If you guys haven't done it, definitely, I would say take a weekend, whether it's NFL or college football. I uh, spent a weekend out in Vegas, uh, just sitting watching those uh, those games in the sports book. It's definitely um, eye opening, and it's and I, I think it's enjoyable. I had a guy who I work with, uh, who, and we need to get to obviously our our college football news. But I got to tell you this, Danny, just because I had a guy I work with who was telling me that um, the Patriots Dolphins game, you know, a week week few weeks back, uh, the Patriots had the spread covered, and they turned the game over to their rookie quarterback, and he ended up fumbling and throwing a pick six. And it cost a lot of people a lot of money because the Patriots ended up putting Tom Brady back in and not covering the spread. So uh, I found that kind of interesting, and it fit your your uh, Vegas story. 
yeah, that a lot of funny things happen towards you know, it's, you know how how teams cover, don't cover, so on and so forth. But oh, we'll move on. We'll move on from that. Yeah. So uh, let's kick things off. Some some big college football news to talk about this week, and uh, we want to thank ESPN for this story. Tom Van Heron and Sam Con Jr. Houston quarterback De'Eric King, along with senior receiver Keith Corbin, uh, decided to take a red shirt. After the Cougars' disastrous 1-3 and three start, Danny, King's a senior and will sit out the rest of this season or return next year. And, you know, it sounds like King, uh, you know, wants to stay. Uh, he says he's staying there. But it sounds like he's looking to show teams uh, some of his other uh, talents and traits he has on the football field. Yeah, I when I heard the first of the story, um, I was T- kind of taking my back away because I typically when this happens, you know, guys sit out and then they, you hear them entering the transfer protocol, looking to uh, transfer as, as a graduate transfer to another team, another t- uh, another school and play immediately. But King is adamant that he wants to stay at Houston and play and, and kind of didn't make sense. So I was just texting with, with some guys that I, I, I trust their judgment and just asking what what's the, the reason behind this decision. And the scuttlebutt is, you know, King is. He's listed as 5'11", but he's, he's around 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, he's a dynamic uh, yeah. athlete with, with the ball in his hand. So 5'8", five, 5'9", five, quarterback in the NFL. And he's played quarterback throughout his collegiate career. So a 5'8", five, 5'9", five, quarterback in the NFL, he kind of got the – saw the writing on the wall that, that it wasn't going to happen for him in the NFL. So he wanted to, I guess, take a redshirt season since this year was, like you said, off to a horrible start, 1-3. and three. Yep. Um, Learn the, the, the new coaches systems um, – the new coach, Dana Holgerstrom's offense system better, and he wanted to showcase some of his other talents. This kid, from our, he, like I said, he's dynamic with the ball in his hands. He runs a four four five forty. Um, he's a, you know he's he's a guy who's got those quick feet and make guys miss you know in the open space. So he wants to kind of, from what I've been told, you know, show teams that he could NFL teams that he could be a a, a slash if you will, a guy who can play some sure. quarterback, a guy who can play some running back, a guy who can play some slot receiver. Maybe even do some some things in, in a return game. So he wants to show his athleticism and his ability to create mismatches in, in on offense. So he wants to take a year, kind of develop learning the offense, and come back next season as that multifaceted you know athlete, if you will, not 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 a quarterback per se. So this is all for him to kind of showcase NFL teams that he could do more uh, with with his talents. Not you know not just necessarily just play quarterback. Um, so. You know, because right now, if you're looking at, you know, teams, a lot of times, you know, people are like, well, you know, Julian Edelman did the same thing, played quarterback in college, and then he came back, got drafted as a receiver. You know, you know other other players like Cordell Stewart played college, uh, quarterback in college and it was, was used not only as a quarterback in the NFL, but also as a receiver. So, you know, why can't he just go ahead and finish his senior season and come into the NFL and do that? Well, the difference here is if he stays as a quarterback this season, He's probably gonna. He's looking to be a six, maybe seventh round pick, maybe even an undrafted free agent. Sure. You know, if he comes back next year, shows his ability as, as a pass catcher, uh, maybe as a running back, maybe as a returner. You yep. know, showing some of his abilities to be, you know, multidimensional on offense. He can go from a sixth, seventh round pick to possibly a third, fourth round pick. You know, and that's that's you know talking about some money there. So. You know, I think that I think that's the reason behind this. Um, you know, if he had if he had done this and then transferred. You know, we, we we know why he did it, but so far he's saying that he's sticking to the program. He'll come back next year, and from what I from what I gather, that this makes sense that he's going to work on his abilities and and de- demonstrate his ability. I say next year in this offense to be uh, you know um you know a weapon, if you will. You see, you look at his stats, Danny. This year he's thrown for six hundred sixty three yards, six touchdowns, two interceptions and rushing for 312 yards with six touchdowns on the ground. Yep. And he broke Tim Tebow's record for most consecutive games of the passing and rushing touchdown, which was 15. Right. And, and and you look at those numbers, and the other part that I wanted to mention here is this rule that was enacted prior to last year that allows athletes to participate in up to four games during a season while they can maintain their red shirt, uh, you know, this rule being enacted, I mean, th- this opens up players to, to be able to pretty much do this if they choose. Is this something positive for college football, Danny? Or, you know, is this something that that could be a, a black eye for, for the college game? Well, 
it, it could be a, it could be both. So if if you if you're the athlete, if you're Derek King, and, and mm-hmm. you're seeing that you know you're thinking about your future, you're thinking about how you project towards an NFL, possibly an NFL career. You, you see that that if you're being played as a quarterback, you're probably not going to be make it there. So you're looking at right. how can I take my talents and best utilize them and and be able to make some money off of off of my talents. So. You know, this way, what he's doing now is, is is taking a year off, and he's going to kind of work on that. Now, if, in other cases, there there have been players that that have lost starting jobs to the backups. Uh, case in point, Kelly Bryant last year with with Clemson, yep, lost yep. his start, starting position to uh, Trevor Lawrence. He said, "You know what? I'm going to go as as a graduate transfer because that was going to be his last season of eligibility in college. I'm going to go as a graduate transfer and go play immediately mm-hmm. at Missouri." You know, uh, this rule was really made for for guys. Uh, who got hurt within a first year or second or second first game or second game, and th- then basically you know they'd have to lose the rest of their you know their season because of right. you know uh, the the rule. I think it was it was prior to this rule being implemented. It was based off of percentages of snaps. If you saw like something like thirty snaps in a season, you're you can't redshirt anymore. You know, so so this rule was was kind of geared for those guys. But now you know these these players are, are taking advantage of of their ability to kind of move around. Like we saw this past off season with the transfer portal, that that became a, a popular term right. in the college football world. Everyone seems like was entering the transfer portal and looking for their opportunities to go ahead and, and expand and, or, or, you know, find places where they can kind of, you know, uh, blow, you know, bolster themselves, you know, towards their next level of their career. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, if, if coaches can up and leave on a dime, I think these kids should be given an opportunity to, to do the same. Now, we we know that if you transfer from one school to another, you have to sit out the whole year. So yep. in some cases, that's a little bit unfair. So a lot of guys just stick it out, even if their coach up and leaves. Sure. But this does give them the opportunity now, you know, to to if they say, hey, you know what, this is not working out for me. Um, it, it's you know, it's something that I'm not interested in, in being here anymore. You have an opportunity. The flip side is, if you take a look at the team now, you know, if you're yeah. if you're Houston and you're saying, you know, what, you know, uh, if you're Derek King's teammates, like. You know, how does that make you feel? Did, did right. he quit on his teammates? That's something that that you know scouts have to take a look at. You know, do you sure. consider him a quitter? You know, is he a guy who's who's a who's a me guy, not a team guy now? You know, is that something that that scouts are going to have to dig into and see if this is something that in his past, you know, he's he's done before as well in other aspects of his life. You know, so uh, that, those are common yeah. things. So so you can look at it both ways. Sure, uh, but Absolutely. you know, for me, for me, the, these college players, I think, um, have been. To a certain extent, been taken advantage of, and I think giving them some sort of leeway to leave. If a coach can leave, I think a player that was recruited by that coach can also leave as well. However, we know the rules don't work that way. Right. But this does give these players some, you know, even though it wasn't intended to give them this opportunity, but it has given them some sort of loophole to be able to, you know, leave the leave one program and go to another one. And speaking of the team, Danny, I want to bring up something that Houston head coach Dana Holgerson said. And he said, you know, anyone suggesting the team is tanking the rest of the year is misguided. I can assure you that whoever is saying that was not in our practice last night, was not in our meetings on Sunday night. These long coaching meetings that we had preparing for a gra- for a game were full go ahead on playing a game this weekend. So that to me is absolute nonsense. And if you turn that to the athletic director, Chris Pesman, he says, we've got kids we've recruited to come into the program that we have confidence in that can play at a high level. We've got a lot lot of confidence in our coaching staff and everybody else that's on the team and in the program. So, you know, sometimes this can be a boost for for these programs that have gotten off to a poor start. And you catch these the, the, the players come in and taking over at the right time. Uh, is that something maybe we see here for Houston, Danny? You know, Coach Holcomb is, is in his first season at, at, at Houston, and he's trying to build a culture. He's trying to build his program. So, I mean, he's going to come out and say that, yes, you know, we have not given up on this season. The, these players are, are still practicing, and, and these players are still going to go ahead and, and, you know, give their all out. And and I don't doubt that one yep. bit, you know. You know, uh, you know, De'Ara King leaving – or redshirting gives his backup an opportunity to step up, gives other players an opportunity to step up and showcase their abilities as well. However, I, I can't be, I can't see this as, as being as a, you know, as a, as a positive for the team. You know, your, your starting quarterback, you know, somewhat your leader on offense, if you will, is deciding to, to take a step back and, and, you know, kind of punt on the season. So, um, 
I don't know. It, it's you know, it, for him to say that they, you know they're practicing hard, they're they're coaching hard. That's what I expect him to say. Again, it's his first season there. He's trying to develop that culture and you know and and build that positive atmosphere. So um, we'll we'll see how they the see the rest of the season plays out. But uh, it's it's definitely a, a curious case of you know we've never seen it happen before. And, and now right, it's, right. It's, I wonder if this is going to create a trend. Is what I'm looking to see is will other players, other programs, other years kind of follow suit here in what De'Ara King and mm-hmm. Keith Corbin are doing. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I Part of me thinks I, I like the rule, and then part of me thinks that I don't. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I would have to read more into it to see what the stipulations are and whatnot. It just seems to me now, you know, the thing if a coach leaves, like you mentioned, Danny, to me, if the coach that you agreed to play under departs, um, then that should open you back up to be able to 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 transfer and, and go someplace else, you know, to be able to just, you know, say, you know what, I'm not playing the rest of this year because whatever the reason, you know, I think it was meant to be for injuries. And, you know, so you, if you get hurt, you have that. To me, I just think this opens it up for, you know, for anything for, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I don't know how, how much I love that, but uh, you know, let's talk about the possibility of Urban Meyer returning to the sidelines in the college game, Danny. Uh, uh, news broke earlier this week um, as he was on a uh, local uh, radio in Columbus, I believe. Uh, Meyer, who coached the Buckeyes, he went 7-0 and against, Michi- against Michigan and was asked if he would ever, you know, if, if he came back to coaching, how about uh, coaching the Michigan Wolverines? And uh, he said, absolutely not. But your thoughts, Danny, on him coming back to coaching? Look, the um, when Herbert Meyer retired, it, I, I had a feeling this this was not going to be his last. Ohio State was not going to be his last college football job. So sure. um, is he coming back? I, eventually, I say yes, he's coming back. Um, is he coming back to coach Michigan? Um if and when Jim Harbaugh gets fired, I highly doubt that. Uh, from what you know, a lot of the rumors were uh, when he first left Ohio State was that you know the, the USC job, you know, moving back out west, yep. uh, would be something that that he would probably have an eye on or interest in if it ever came open. So uh, USC obviously having a, having a solid bounce back season under Clay Helton. So I think they're 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 currently 21 in the nation. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll see if, if that something out West ever opens up, but, but I think for him to, you know, because he built such a, a you know, a, a powerhouse at Ohio state and, and, and won the, you know, the championships and, and has that legacy at Ohio state. I don't think he'd go and, and coach what their biggest rival at Michigan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just me, obviously. Yep. But, uh, you know, I've been surprised before. I've been shocked before by what some of these coaches do, but you know, for me, I, I think urban Meyer is coming back. Eventually, and I think um, I think out west, whether it's USC or some other Pac-12 school, I think that's where it's headed. Yeah, you know, and and, and here's the funny part. So, Bet Online released odds uh, for Michigan's next coach if Harbaugh doesn't return. So that's whether he's fired, decides to step down, uh, ends up back in the NFL, takes another possible coaching job someplace in the college game. They had Meyer at seven to one to be Michigan's next head coach behind Stanford's David Shaw, who, mind you, uh, does um, the NFL draft for NFL Network. I I love his work on there. And uh, Virginia's Bronco Mendenhall. So to me, I, I, you know, Meyer, he, he made some statements too to WBNS. I feel very good where I'm at. The uh, Ohio State Athletic Director, Gene Smith, and him are very close. He loves working there and teaching. He said, three months ago, I had a problem. What if I'm sitting here in October and I can't stand what I'm doing? He said, but I love what I'm doing. My family loves what I'm doing. And those are really the only people that matter to me. Uh, You know, I mean, clearly, he clearly had a major health problem, you know, and if it forced him to be off the sidelines, is the best thing to go back? That's that's the question I have, Danny. You know, is it really a possibility? I don't think so, but, you know. But one thing about these coaches, Ryan, is is this is what they do. This is yeah. – it's in their blood. 
uh, some of them, you know, will, will coach till they, till they die. I mean, I mean, I'm just, you know, not trying to be, you know, vague about it or rude about it, but just, that's how they are. This is what they do this. This is all they know how to do. So, you know, Meyer, Meyer is, is, is lucky that he's got TV as an opportunity to kind of, you know, you know, fulfill that, that, that need if he wants to, you know, to co- cover college football. But I, I think, you know, a guy that's successful, you know, he's still not, you know, up there in age, you know, where you think he's not in, like he's in seventies or anything like that, where you yep. think, all right, just take it easy and relax. And I think it, it might not be this year, it might not be next year, but I, I think eventually, I think the it's going the itch is going to be too too much for him. He's going to want to come back, and I, I think eventually he you will see him back on the sidelines. However, you know, spinning it, speaking of coaches, has there a coach ever fallen out of grace as quickly as Jim Harbaugh has it at Michigan? Well, I mean, when you don't win. <laughs> I mean, they were. I mean, jumping for joy. I mean, oh, yeah. they, I mean, they they were celebrating him. I remember the he, he was introduced at a uh, at a Michigan basketball game when he got hired, and I, I believe like a section of the of the students was all wearing khaki pants, like like the he the Harba does on the sideline. So it's like sure. he was heralded as as the savior, and all of a sudden now, how quickly he's fallen from grace, right? Well, it's not stopping his his television commercial deals because I just saw a new one with uh, I want to say it was like Dockers or somebody that um, it's a kid hired uh, to basically wash his khakis. <laughs> so uh-huh. uh, I definitely don't think he sees certain in the uh, khaki financial department. But uh, you're right. I mean, you know, here's a guy who he comes from the NFL. He he led the Niners to a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, I, obviously people remember it cause the lights went out in the middle of it, you know, team didn't win. He was there, you know, Colin Kaepernick and, and all that stuff. So he comes to this program with, you know, some success in the NFL and, you know, they just haven't been able to, to put it together. You know, I, I, I think some of the problem stems from their quarterback play. That's just an outsider and, looking. And that's in. the thing, though, because because in the NFL he was known as a guy who fixed quarterbacks, right? He yes. fixed Alex Smith. He he got count the best out of Colin Kaepernick, you know. And yet he goes to Michigan and he can't win. And and he gets a kid like Shea Patterson, who you know when I first talked about my preseason top ten quarterbacks, I had him on there because I had hope for this kid. He's got something in terms of athleticism. He's got the the arm strength, I think, to make plays. But yet, however, he he just can't win with these with these quarterbacks. And I just I just don't know what's going on there. And that and that makes you wonder too, Danny. Is it his offense that that he's not? He, I mean, I hate to bring it up because I think of it, and then I think and I look at the Bears now while Mitch played better. You know, is are, are is he not gearing his quarterbacks to their strengths, similar to Matt Nagy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well that's the thing. Was this year he brought in Josh Gaddis from Alabama, who's going to bring in that up tempo hybrid? You know. Uh, a spread system where they're going to spread out the field, the defense, and and, and kind of let Shea Patterson kind of sh- you know showboat his his skills, his ability to run, yeah. his ability to throw, you know, some RPOs, you know, stuff like that, and it just hasn't worked out for him so far. So uh, th- that's a, that's a head scratcher for me. I didn't, I'm like I'm like he's still getting talent though. I mean that's the one thing about Harbaugh. He can still recruit. He's still getting some some prime talent there. Um, it's just it just hasn't been able to put it together offensively. You know, and when you can't beat your your rival at Ohio State, it's that's you know that's big. That's a big. That's no-no. huge. That's yep. absolutely huge. I, and and rivalries. I mean, you you think about it. I, I know at least where I live here in New York State, some of those rivalries go down to Pop Warner football. So, uh, you know, getting up to the college and the NFL level. I mean, they. I mean, you guys, you know, being a Bears fan, how much we we hate the Packers and. Although I think I might hate the Eagles more. Um, but <laughs> uh, so let's talk about Miami senior linebacker uh, Zach McLeod a little bit. So he's also, uh, as we talked about the red shirt just a few moments ago, he's chosen to do that uh, for his final year of eligibility as well, Danny. And this is a little bit different of a scenario, I think, um, than the Houston players that have done it as he's just not getting the reps uh, this year on the field because, uh, you know, they've, they've, they're only going with two linebackers this year, right? So Yeah, they, they have two, two stud linebackers in Shaquille Quarterman and Michael Pinckney, and they predominantly have gone with the two linebacker sets on defense because those guys are, are pretty good in terms of, you know, pass coverage and, and especially, you know, playing the run. So they haven't really needed uh, to use a third linebacker. So I think McLeod, what he's doing here is, is like instead of letting his – 
you know, final season of eligibility, just go to waste sitting on a bench. He's going to, you know, uh, redshirt and, and come back next year and hopefully, you know, be a part of the, uh, part of the, uh, the program again. But, um, typically when, uh, with him, I, I like to see what happens. Um, you know, if, if he's a graduate transfer, he, of course, as we talked about earlier, he could leave, go to a different school and play immediately. So as opposed to if you're just a regular, if you're a junior or sophomore and you transfer, you got to wait a whole season out. So uh, we'll, we'll see what 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 uh, Zach does next season. But, yeah, you know, the reason about, given for him deciding to retro this season is because of the lack of playing time. Um, and he just didn't want to lose a year of, you know, his last year of eligibility. I get it for the player, but at the same time, it's sorry about your luck kind of a thing. You, you know what I mean? Like it, what, it, it's almost one of those uh, participation trophy things in, in this instance to me, you know, Hey, you play it. Everybody gets a trophy. Look, you were, you were a player on this roster. They they've decided to go with two linebackers. Your, your goal should have been to beat one of those two out and it didn't work. So now you're relegated to backup duty. You know, hopefully it's not an injury that thrusts you into the lineup. But to me, it's, you know, it's almost, you got to go out and earn it. And it almost seems like they're making it too easy now for, for, for these kids to, to not have to do that. Or I say kids, but I mean, some of these guys are grown men at this point, Danny. You know, all these players, you know, whether you're a, you know, a third string linebacker or you're a starting linebacker, you will you have all these people now, your friends, family are telling you, hey, man, you know, you should be starting. You'd be starting if you go to yeah. this school, you'd be starting here. So they all get into this kid's head. And, and, you know, next thing you know, it's like he's thinking, all right, what do I do? Do I listen to my friends and family? Do I, you know, stay? So I'm sure, you know, he's, he's spoken with his coach, you know, Manny Diaz in Miami, and, and he's, you know, probably kind of hash things out here. So sure. if, that's what I'm saying. I, I want to see what happens going into the future. Cause if Diaz has assured him that he'll play next year, you know, cause I, I think both Quarterman and, and Pinckney will be NFL uh, prospects next year or NFL players next year, I should say. So I think, you know, uh, McLeod should play next year. So, or will he just, you know, up and leave and go to a different school? So I think that that's more of a, a to be determined as opposed to, you know, Derek King, who's, who's kind of said, come out and said, you know, I'm staying here. And, and, and I've kind of heard things the same thing that he's going to yep. stay there and kind of utilize his other talents. So, you know, McLeod's a, a kid to, to keep an eye on in terms of future, what he does, you know, will he, you know, will he actually stay and, and, and replace one of those two linebackers or will he then, I sh- you know, or maybe just transfer altogether and go to a whole different school. So before we bring Russ Landy in, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, Danny, is uh, th- this Tennessee football team. They had three more players and linebackers, uh, Will Ignat, uh, Shannon Reed, and wide receiver Jacquez Jones leave the team. And head coach Jeremy Pruitt confirmed the exits of all three players and that uh, Reed and Jones had entered the transfer protocol uh, what what's going on here in Tennessee that these players are just dropping like flies? Yeah, I mean these are the, these kids are are kids that uh, Pruitt did not recruit himself. So yeah, that's what happens. You know, with with a new coaching regime coming in, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you might be used in a different manner. You you might not be used at all. You you might fit the system. You might not fit the system. So that's why I I, I think this 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 is where these kids are now taking advantage of this, the transfer protocol. They're taking advantage of the, the red shirting season and, and, and kind of move finding what's best for them. So, um, you know, but speaking of Tennessee and Pruitt, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know how much longer he has at that job. I mean, they're off to a horrible start. Right. Um, they look like a team that really has, has already quit in the season. Um, so, you know, we'll see how, how that transpires for the rest of the, the, the campaign, but man, that, that's just a, it's a bad, um, it's a bad feel around that program, you know, currently. So if Pura can turn that around, that, that'd be a one, one heck of a, uh, one sure. heck of a job there. And it's such a historic program, you know, over the yeah. years you think back and now you see this happening and, and I'll be honest, Danny, I'm nervous from a Syracuse orange. I mean, Dino Babers comes out last season has a phenomenal season. Now this year, he's got the last few remaining players from the prior coaching regime. And next year he's about to finally have his, first class of his own players and i'm seeing rumors online of him possibly uh you know going to michigan state or florida state or or one of these other schools and you know it i'm just nervous about it yeah i mean that's what happens with with all these you know these you know schools that sometimes if if you're not being if you're not considered you know a, a, a premier job or or a, or a job that, you know, other coaches want, you know, you're, you're always kind of striving for what's next, what's best. And one of these, you know, one of these big, you know, big powerhouses come looking for you, like a Florida state 
or what was the other school you mentioned? Uh, maybe Michigan, or for example, Michigan you know, State. Yeah, yep. yeah. You know, um, although I, I don't think D'Antonio is isn't in trouble at Michigan State, but however, you know, you, you never know what happens. But right. if one of these bigger schools, you, you know, you you consider a, a, a step up, you know, if if they come knocking and they're going to be throwing the money out at you, you know, unfortunately, that's part of the business. That's why a lot of these kids get stuck. You know, they sure, they commit sure. four years, you know, typically three to four years to to a program to a coach. And then lo and behold, you know, after a year or two, the coach up and leaves, yep. you know, no fault of his, he's, he's looking to, you know, promote his career. He's looking to, you know, just sure. look at, think of us, right. If we, if they come to us and says, you know, our, our employers come and say, hey, you know, we're going to promote you or another company comes and says, we'll give you more money. You, mm-hmm. you know, you do the same job and, yeah. you know, give you, you know, more money, more, more, you know, benefits and all that stuff, you know, we're going to up and leave as well. So it's, it's just, that's how it is, you know, and, and it's becoming yep. more prevalent nowadays. It seems like. Than it was in the past. You know, in the past, you, you know, a college program would have the same coach mm-hmm. for years on years, right? Yeah. And then, you know, if, once that coach retired or had like, you know, four or five bad seasons, then he might get fired and then they'd re- replace him with probably an assistant. But now it's just like you go and plucking, you know, coaches from school to school to school. So, you know, what what surprised me is is that Northwestern has done a great job of holding on to, to Pat Fitzgerald. You know, mm-hmm. he's a guy that has always been considered an up and coming and up and comer in terms of the coaching ranks and sure. Um, you know, the, the job he's done at Northwestern has, has been terrific over his tenure there. So, you know, there's there's always, you know, rumors about him. Yep. You know, whenever a big job comes up, you know, whether it's Notre Dame, whether it's Michigan, whether it's any other big name school, there's always the, the fear of Pat Fitzgerald might pick up and leave. You know, so far he hasn't. So far he's resisted temptation and has stayed at his alma mater at Northwestern. So we'll see how long that resists, but yep. that lasts. But, you know, same thing with you know, Babers, you know. So yep, yep. you're always kind of fearful that these guys might, you know, up and leave one day. Well, I got great news, Danny. We have Russell Landy on the line with us. And uh, for those of you who don't know Russell Landy, uh, he's at a part of Infectious Scouting. Uh, he's former CFL, NFL, and XFL scout. He's an instructor at SMWW for football, GM, and scouting class and principal and real estate company. Uh, company. Russell, welcome to the show. I'm host Ryan Badgley. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me on tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I'll introduce you to Danny Shimon, our Bears Barroom Radio Network draft analyst. Russ, how you doing? I'm doing great, Danny. I got to tell you, you guys are talking about two of my favorites when you mentioned Dino and uh, and, and Fitz. There, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Fitz is the bomb. I mean, anybody that would turn down 10 million a year for Michigan to stay at his alma mater, I mean, that that, that he ain't going anywhere. Trust me, that he's been offered so many big time gigs, and even as I've been told, one NFL gig, he ain't going anywhere. He is staying put. He ain't ever leaving Northwestern, from what I've been told. That's uh, that'll make a lot of Northwestern alums very, very happy to hear that because I mean, every time a big college you know program opens up, you always hear his name always being bandied about as as a top candidate. So you know, like like you said, he's done a great job at his tenure at Northwestern. Really has produced some some very competitive teams with with not you know very great talent, uh, but you know he always gets his, his players to play hard for him, and and I I, I love the job he's done at Northwestern. Yeah, being a Syracuse fan, I really hope Dino Babers goes nowhere. I, I got to be honest. I mean, I've been at the Dome the last two weeks, and he he really has uh, that program headed in the right direction. And I really hope to see him continue to do that here. I mean, uh, you know, uh, DeVito's growing, learning the offense, and I think by this time next year, I think that program is really going to take that leap. Uh, you know, personally speaking. I, I agree with you. I think he, Dino is a guy that he, he, just when you're around him, and I've only met him once or twice, and I'm definitely not friends with him by any stretch, but I've met him once or twice, and his just enthusiasm for football, his enthusiasm for life, about coaching young kids, it comes off when you meet this guy. Sure. And you're instantly in love with him, and I think that's why he's able to get kids to come to places. Everywhere he's been, he's won, and I think as long as he stays at Syracuse, he's not just going to win, but he's going to win with players that are happy to be playing for him, it really build that sort of that trust and that that love of the program that helps those players that leave go help recruit the next generation of players that stay there because Dino has a unique charisma about him. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And and I'm gonna turn things over to Danny so you guys can talk some uh, scouting prospects here. And uh, Danny will throw some questions at you, and then we'll uh, maybe look ahead to this weekend's games and uh, possibly get uh, your thoughts on uh, some prospects to watch this weekend. Uh, so Danny, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, Russ. Uh, so you know, four weeks into the college football season, um, what if anything has surprised you so far? Whether it's a certain team, a certain prospect player, what what has caught your eye? Uh, you know, four weeks into this college football season. You know, I mean, there's a few things that really jump out at me. I mean, 
I did not expect Jacob Eason to really sort of step in and, and be as good as he's been so quickly out of University of Washington. Um, I think anytime a kid transfers out of a major program, he was over there in Georgia and, and couldn't beat out Frome. And he goes out there to Washington. A lot of people thought this was going to be sort of a learning year where he wouldn't show much. But I tell you what, physically, he's shown that there's no question, at least pure physical talent, he's an NFL guy. And when you see some of the throws, some of the decisions he's made on the field the last two weeks, I think people are sort of getting excited that whether it's this year or a year from now when he decides to come out, this kid's got a chance to be a really special player at the next level. And the other thing that stood out to me, I think before the season, there was so much hype about Iowa had A.J. Penenza, the defensive end, and Ohio State had, had Chase Young. And everybody said, oh, it's the two best defensive ends in the country. Who's going to be the guy? And I kept looking back at the film from last year saying, wait a second, Penenza was a, the third defensive end at Iowa, and you're comparing him to Chase Young? I was like, are you people out of your mind? And so far this year, I think that's sort of come true is Chase Young has proven, yes, I am a dominant premier, top 10, top five. It's all going to wash itself out over the next six months. Epinenza has shown flashes, but he has not proven at all to me that he is even a definite first rounder. So those are the two things to me, Eason and those two DNs that have jumped out at me so far. So I guess that that kind of answers my next question was, you know, early on, you know, again, we're looking ahead to kind of to the next April's draft. Who would be your draft risers and followers? So I guess Eason and, and would be a riser and, and Epinenza would be your follower. Or are there other players that, that you, you know label as followers or slash risers, if you will? You, you know, I mean, just due to injury, I mean, you got to say the Walter Little kid out at Stanford um, right. missing the whole year. He was an offensive tackle. I mean, had a chance to be a, a top 15 or 20 pick. Um, and the other kid, I think it's really sort of risen, and it's due to an injury, is, is the right tackle Tristan Wiltz at Iowa. I mean, Al- Alaric Johnson, who is their left tackle coming into the year, is injured. So Wiltz flips over, and he's played both right and left during games, which I think is an enormously valuable trait when NFL scouts look at it because we know he can throw you from side to side with ease. But he's played great football, and he's shown that athletically he can handle either side He's got feet. He's got the flexibility to sit down and block with base. Good hand use. I mean, when I look at that kid, I see a five-position offensive lineman. I see a guy that's going to be a first-round pick as long as he stays healthy. So I think he's really a guy that sort of blossomed this year. And obviously the little kid and even the Alaric Johnson due to injuries, we don't know what that's going to do. It could hurt their status. But a lot of time, if the injury turns out to be something that's not going to have a long-term effect, teams will just go back and watch the pre-injury film. And if their medical team clears them, it really won't drastically affect their draft stock. Yeah, I had, I had both Jackson and Wirfs as my in my top ten in preseason in terms of uh, tackle pro, offensive line prospects. But for Wirfs, getting back to him for a kid that big and, and for him to move the way he does, it's really really impressive. It, it, I think he showed me personally more athleticism than, than I thought he had coming into the season. I think it's I think he's shown everybody. I don't think it's just you. I think a lot of people looked at him and sort of said, oh is he a traditional right tackle? Because when you physically just look at him, he's got a huge, thick lower body. And you almost think, oh, it's probably going to be a little bit limited in terms of foot quickness. Probably not going to be a great athlete because he's just so thick in the lower body. But once you actually see this kid, it really jumps out at you. He's pretty nimble for a guy that's clearly, I mean, he has the bottom half of a 350-pound player. I mean, he is thick below the haunches. And he mm. can move, he can he can bend, he can slide, he can, re, he can slide back and readjust. I mean, there's not much other than the fact that I wonder how upper body, how big he is, because he does get knocked around at times if guys can get into his chest. But he really impressed me. He was a guy, and I'm a huge fan of Iowa linemen because mm-hmm. that was one of my schools way back when when I was at the Browns, and I've maintained close relationships with pretty much their whole staff there. So I just I just have an affinity for Iowa guys, and especially the linemen. And this kid, to me, I just I just really like what he brings to the table, and I. I'd love to see him have a lightning bolt on his uh, on his helmet next year, playing for the uh, what I will always call the San Diego Chargers. <laughs> you know, it's funny we we actually talked offensive linemen last week, and my my question for you, f- sticking with that offensive lineman theme, was Trey Adams, the offensive tackle out of Washington. You know, this this guy's mammoth as well. I mean, six eight, and his problem has been staying healthy. You know, where do you see him, you know, throughout the rest of the season, if he can stay healthy? Is he one of those guys you're going to see climb up uh, on the draft boards if he can stay healthy? 
oh, there's no question. If he, if he stays healthy and then goes through the medical check and the injuries that he's had in the past don't jump out and grab a red flag and say, hey, this is going to be a long-term problem once he's in the NFL. As long as that doesn't happen yet, he's, he's a first-round guy. Not only is it talent, because I, when you watch the film, when he is healthy, he can do everything you want to protect the corner. Now, he's not always consistent lowering his pad level, but when you're that big and that athletic, you can get away occasionally with playing with a little bit high pad level. Mm-hmm. But the added bonus is the people at that school, this is a kid they go to bat for. You talk mm-hmm. to the coaches, the strength staff, everybody there, they say, this is the kid you want your daughter to bring home. That's the type of kid you want to know. Sure. I'm willing to put my, put my money on the table and say, hey, even if the injury might be a problem, I know this kid's going to do everything in his power to work through it. He's probably going to play hurt because he wants to be out on the field. So to me, those things are what make him so exciting. If he stays healthy, he is going to be a first-round tackle. Everything that I've seen on film points to that. Right. And I, and I think he can play left tackle in the NFL. Russ, do you agree? Yep. Oh, yeah, no question. I mean, I think today in the NFL, I mean, there are some bad left tackles out there. And when I look at this kid, he's better than athletically than a number of the guys that are starting at left tackle in the NFL. So there's no doubt. Yeah, I, I love I love Trey Adams as well. So just something I've been wanting to ask you for, for a while, you know, is you've scouted for both NFL teams, CFL teams. And just someone like, like me who, who loves the scouting process, who loves digging into tape, who loves, you know, doing some of the background stuff, you know, is the – the scouting process different for the two leagues or is it relatively the same? You know, it's relatively the same. I mean, you're still scouting football. You're still st- trying to identify traits. I think the thing, at least for scouting in the CFL that becomes readily apparent is as soon as you see a, at least a flash of elite athletic ability, you can almost cross them off your list because he's never, or at least not for another five years, going to get a peak in the CFL because if you are really gifted, we rarely see those guys in the CFL. The, the CFL sees quicker than fast guys, big guys who know what they're doing, but we don't get the dynamic special athletes. It just, you don't get them. Um, and I think the other thing that people don't realize the big difference between scouting for the CFL and scouting for the NFL is when the CFL holds their draft, the CFL draft is only for Canadian citizens. So, all the Americans that play in Canada, it's sort of a first-come, first-serve signing. The players we draft in the CFL draft are all Canadian. So, like, this year, I'm looking at the kid at Notre Dame, Chase Claypool, the big receiver, because he's technically Canadian, because his mom's a Canadian citizen. So he has citizenship as a, Canadian, as, a, as a Canadian. So even though he'll get a shot in the NFL and probably play in the NFL for a long time, he will be drafted in the CFL, because if he ever comes up there where you have to play, you have to start seven Canadians, and you have to have 20 one out of your 46 players on your team must be Canadian. A player like Claypool has enormous value. Right. I'm, I'm a big Claypool fan. I, I put him in my preseason top top 10 receivers. My question with Claypool is, do you think or do you project him possibly at tight end in, in, at the NFL? Or is he a strictly receiver? You know, I, th- I think that truthfully is going to be something that I have not had the chance to go see him live. And I'd love to see what his body structure is um, to see is what are his hips like. Does he have the hips to really be a 235, 40 pound guy in terms of a lot of guys can gain weight at receiver and be that weight, but can he really be a 240 pound guy in terms of taking hits, getting in the meat and taking shots across the middle? Because even receivers who go across the middle, they don't take the same shots that tight ends do because tight ends are doing such quick turnaround stuff across the middle a lot of time. So that's the thing. I want to see him physically. I think when you watch him on film, he can do either one. He can be a big receiver. He can be a tight end. I just want to see where he physically is at before I sort of assign him to a spot. But yeah, he's, I really like the kid. The only question I have is just running. I mean, is mm-hmm. he going to be a guy that can get away from people at the next level, or is he going to mm-hmm. be a guy like Keenan Allen who has to rely upon just being the perfect route runner and setting guys up and knowing how to get open? That, to me, is the only thing I wonder about with Clay. All right, just going back real quick to the offensive lineman, uh, when I was breaking down some, some preseason tape, the, the kid that really surprised me, I don't know why, I mean, he, this guy's been a starter for, since the, the day he got on campus, was Ezra Cleveland out of Boise State. Just looks to me like, like a natural athlete, a left tackle. Have you had a chance to take a look at his tape yet, uh, Russ, and you know, what do you think? You know, I haven't graded him, but I've seen him when I've done some Boise State film. And, yeah, I agree with you. Athletically, it's there. Um, I think the big challenge people want to see is, you don't really get to see him go against those quick twitch guys off the corner. So although he's athletic, when he's going against that 
that elite guy. I want to see how does he shuffle? Does he, does he take the correct angle? Does he shoot his hand at the right time? Does he know what to do with his inside hand based on what the guy's doing? All, excuse me, all those little things that he doesn't really get challenged on regularly because he's not going against a Chase Young on a regular basis. So those are things I want to see. But athletically, yeah, I think it's there. And, and it's sort of unfair for me <laughs> to say the level of talent against who he's going because Boise State has sort of put themselves in position to be a top 20, 25 program over the past decade. So mm-hmm. I'm sort of not being fair to the kid. But at the same time, he's not playing the same athletes week in and week out. And that's what you just have to be concerned with. Yeah, I agree, Russ. Uh, you know, I want to kind of change the momentum here and talk about the upcoming games this weekend and what prospects you, you, you kind of have a focus on uh, for the upcoming games this weekend. Well, you know, I mean, this coming weekend, one of the games I'm, I'm sort of excited to see is we mentioned Claypool earlier. They're going against Virginia. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to see him and Bryce Hall go. Bryce Hall is not a dominant player, but it's hard to find six foot plus corners with hips and with ball skills. He's got those. So I want to see how does he do. Now, I don't know if he'll be matched up against Claypool more than probably a half dozen or maybe a dozen plays, but mm-hmm. I want to see that matchup. I think it's going to be really an interesting one to take a look at. The, the other game that I'm, I think is, is just going to be an absolute blast to watch, and it's not because they're going to go against each other, but it's because you sort of get to look at two players in, in terms of uh, Johnson, the big receiver out at Minnesota. I'm senior receiver. Um, to me, he's Keenan out. The guy, other than being able to not run, he yep. can do everything you want as a receiver. I mean, he's fundamentally sound. He maintains his uh, route integrity right up until break point, gets his head in his hands around quick, catches the ball. So you're going to get to watch him when Minnesota has the ball. And then when Purdue has the ball, you get to see the kid who's not draft eligible, but you get to see Ronda Moore, who may be the most polar opposite of Johnson in that you're talking about a midget who you could probably eat peanuts off his head, <laughs> but he has, He's just dynamic and explosive. When he gets the ball and he has space, it's like, oh, watch out. This is Billy White Shoes Johnson all over again. I mean, this guy, he, he's got electricity when he has space to move because he can go from zero to full speed in like two, two and a half steps. I mean, and he's natural. It's not like one of those guys like, and I'm not trying to bash him because Teddy Ginn has had a 10-year career, but Teddy's sort of a straight line, linear kid. Yeah. This kid can get to full speed while making a cut. I mean, he's, he's truly special. So I'm excited to watch that game because you're talking about two receivers whom I both believe will play in league for 10 years who are completely different physical specimens. And those are the types of things I love to see that because it really makes you as a scout get better because you're seeing opposite players at, in the same game and you get to compare and contrast as you're watching. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's going to be a phenomenal game and, and definitely two players to keep an eye on there. And, and Russ, before we let you go, one of the things we like to do, um, I know it's early, we know it's early, um, we like to get your Heisman favorite and maybe talk a little bit about the player as well um, and just get your, uh, get your thoughts on why you, you have them as your Heisman favorite. You know, I mean, and I hate to be the guy that sounds like everybody else, but, you know, if he's healthy, the kid from Wisconsin, I mean, John Taylor, I mean, if he, if he isn't at least not just – the front runner. I mean, if he, if he ain't in the top two or three, I mean, this kid is special. I mean, I've been grading the big 10 literally since 01 when I was at the, at the Browns, that was my area. And I've seen all the Wisconsin backs from Melvin Gordon to Ron Dane to all these guys. None of them is close to this kid. This kid's on a whole nother level because Mm -hmm. very few of those guys may be going as back as Terrell Fletcher 20 years ago could change directions like this kid. And mm-hmm. this kid's not a little 185 or 95 pound guy. This is a thickly built, powerful kid who breaks tackles, who can also snap a foot in the ground and explode the other direction. I mean, mm-hmm. he's really fun to watch. He's willing to stick his nose in there and pass pro. He catches the ball decently, which for a Wisconsin back is rare because most of them come out of there with about 15 career catches because it never <laughs> throw to the running back. Yeah. Uh, this kid, to me, he, he's really impressive. I know he got hurt last week and after he had 200 yards on like 17 carries in the first quarter when they were just destroying Jim Harbaugh's uh, Wolverines there. But, I mean, this Taylor kid, he's, he's fun to watch. I know that most of the Wisconsin backs have struggled at the next level. But he, he really, to me, he's a guy that could be not only the Heisman winner, he could force a team to say, you know, we really shouldn't take it back in the top 10. We really shouldn't do it, even though teams have taken Barkley and teams have mm-hmm. taken Ellie. Yep. We're going to take this kid, 
even though I would never in a million years take a running back in the first round, this kid's pretty dang special. I got to be honest with you, Russ. I, he's my favorite to win the Heisman at, right at this point, too. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, I feel like there's so much emphasis on the quarterback play that sometimes some of these other playmakers don't don't get that that. Uh, notice that they should. And I'm excited to hear you say that because sh- shockingly, you're the first person to mention him as a Heisman favorite on our show. So uh makes me feel He's good to know that. I, I think so too. D- Danny, w- would you agree with Russ there? I I love Jonathan Taylor. And, and the, the thing about him and Russ, you hit on it. Uh, well, two things. First of all, Russ, I totally agree with you. I, and I've been saying it on, on this show. I would never pick a running back in the first round. So thank you for agreeing. You know, we, we agree on that one. And then uh, second thing, well, Taylor, the size and the breakaway speed that he has. You, you it's, rarely it's see that in a, in a back that big with that size. He can literally run away from corners, safeties, anybody. He'll run away from them. And that, that's something that's very, very impressive. That's something that's going to translate at the, at the next level. Oh, there's no question. And the thing that even though, like we both agree, don't take a running back in the first round. The good thing with him is if you say, you know what, I have to, you know, you can use him on all three downs. You know, you can split him out. You can run routes. So at least he can contribute as a pass catcher because you don't have to hand him the ball 20 times to get impact. You can give him 14 carries, let him catch seven passes, and he's still going to make a dynamic impact in the game. And, and he's getting better at pass catching as well. He's he's had some some big plays uh, as a pass catcher this season as well. So I, I think I like the fact that he's expanding his game in, in that area. A hundred percent. I mean, he to me is better catching the ball than Melvin Gordon was, and Melvin Gordon has proven to be an outstanding receiver in the NFL. This kid will probably be better, although it, he doesn't have that linear ability in terms of length. Melvin's re- he has the arm length and and plays like a six two or six three back, even though he's about five eleven. This kid's going to be limited in terms of he's not going to have that great length for catching. But other than that, he's really, really good compared to Melvin when Melvin was coming out catching the ball. Agree. Well, before we let you go, Russ, we want to give you a chance. Uh, let our fans know uh, where they can follow you. Um, anything you've got to promote, please go ahead. The floor is yours and, and share with our fans where they can find you. Well, the best thing they can do is follow me on Twitter. It's at Russ Landy. It's uh, L-A-N-D-E. Um, my website is uh, RussLandy.com. It's infectious scouting. Uh, we put out a draft guide. It started, restarted this year after spending the last six years scouting in the CFL when I wasn't allowed to share my reports. So we're back covering the NFL draft. And our book in the past has had anywhere from 450 to 500 reports on players. And uh, we use a very different grading scale than anybody else covering the draft. It's one that 12 NFL teams use. It's alphabetical and numerical, and it'll open people's eyes to the way teams scout in the NFL. doesn't mean I'm always going to be right or miss on a ton of players, but it does mean you're going to see what a scout in the NFL, what his reports are going to look like, and sort of the, the system and the way I go about scouting is different than any other draft company out there. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, we're excited to see that for sure, Russ. Uh, definitely something that uh, we'll, we'll want to pick up. And uh, we want to thank you for coming on the show tonight, man. You were a phenomenal guest. Had a great time talking to you. And we look forward to, to doing it again uh, down the road for sure. Thank you so much, Russ. You Appreciate got it, guys. Russ. Thank you guys so much for having me tonight. And anytime you want me, I'm here in Chicago. Just reach out. I will be happy to come on as often as you guys like. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, Yeah, we appreciate that, Russ. Thank you so much, man. Have a good night. You too, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Wow, Danny. I mean, we're knocking it out of the park with guests uh, to to start this off. I can sit there and talk to Russ for hours and, you know, I mean, just, just me and him going back and forth on prospects and, and technique and, and what he sees on a player and what I see. It's just, it's just awesome talking to these scouts, guys who've done it for, for a living, you know, and, and kind of, you know, bounce ideas off of them and bounce prospects off of them. It's, it's something else. It's just some part of the, part of the thing that I really do enjoy, especially like you go down to the senior bowl, you know, you sit there and you, and they're, they're in the crowd and, and you know what? You go up there and just kind of bounce some, you know, some players off of them, and and they're open and they're willing to talk about it. You know, whether it's you know, obviously they're not going to give you team secrets or, or what they're right, thinking, but right. they'll they'll talk about a prospect in terms of what they like, what they don't like personally. You know, um, you know, technique wise, weight wise, you know, body shape wise. It, it's it's so much, it's so awesome to sit there and just talk and 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 just learn from these guys who've done it for a living. I mean, just the the amount of knowledge, you know, just listening to Russ talk, the amount of knowledge that he has on the game. I, I mean, 
absolutely amazing. Another phenomenal. And, I and mean, he's done it. And he's done it in both leagues. The CFL yeah, he's done and it. That's NFL. the thing that he's done it in both leagues that, I mean, I don't think I know anyone who's ever done anything with the CFL. <laughs> I'm sure that probably sounds bad, but I don't, I really don't pay much or any attention to the CFL at all. And that probably makes me sound football stupid, but I follow the college game and the pro game. So to hear that he's done that just absolutely amazes me, you know, and, and to hear him bring up names on your list, Danny, um, you know, the receiver from Minnesota, you know, Tyler you, Johnson. Yep. Yeah. Tyler Johnson, uh, you know, to being able to talk offensive linemen with, with him as well. And, uh, I love the fact that Jonathan Taylor was his, uh, you know, early pick to win the Heisman because, you know, we have it, we've had guests on the show and, you know, it, it's all quarterback love. Yeah. Everybody it's loves Trevor Lawrence. All yeah. too well. it's, <laughs> yeah. No one picks my guy. Though. No one ever picks Sam Ellinger. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the guests. that's going to pick Sam right? Ellinger. <laughs> You know, so to see Jonathan Taylor, so I I had a a couple of guys I work with. I actually got to watch Jonathan Taylor live this weekend um, as they went to uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and then the next day went to the Green Bay Denver game. And, you know, talking to them and them seeing him in person, I, I mean, he didn't play in the second quarter, Danny, and he still rushed for 203 yards. That's amazing. Right. And that, like I said, I've been, I'm an advocate of, of you do not draft running backs in the first round because you can always find them, uh, at least in the top 15 portion of the first round, because you can always find good running backs in the second, third round. Uh, but, but you know, like Russ made a good point. Like there are certain backs that are just special. And, you know, if you if you draft them, you're going to have a bell cow running back uh, for the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, whatnot. So uh, that's the thing with, with Taylor is, is because he gives you the size, he gives you the ability to be a buck out. He can, he can carry the load. He can be a 20, 25 carry a game guy. He's improving in the passing game, so he can be a three down back. He's mm-hmm. got that breakaway speed, the, the, the ability to, if you, you know, hand him off, hand him the ball, he can break it for 20, 30, 40 yards, even go to the house. You know, he can take a swing pass out of the backfield, make a guy miss and take it to the house. So he's got that electricity in him for a guy that size. That's what makes them so special and so rare. Yeah, absolutely. And Danny, they're they're Wisconsin uh, hosting Northwestern this weekend. Is yeah. you know, I want I want to kind of get your thoughts on uh, you know, I know we talked to Russ about the games he's watching, but uh, before we we head out here for the night, I want to get your thoughts on the games that you're going to be paying attention to, paying attention to this weekend, and specifically, you know, the prospects you're going to be watching. Obviously, I know you're going to be watching Northwestern Wisconsin, right. um, but what are some of the other games you're going to be interested in? this weekend actually northwestern wisconsin uh, i will be watching that game but but it's not that was not on my five my top five list here okay uh, my, my my top five list uh i got uh, the first one is, is a pac-12 showdown with uh arizona state versus cal you know cal has, has come on done, done a great job they uh they're 15th in the nation i think currently um in, in the rankings and and asu uh, of course herm edwards has done a great job of turning that program in, around really, I mean, they're yep. they're a, a tough minded kind of like their coach, a tough minded, hard nosed team that will grind it out. You know, they, mm-hmm. they have a, a running back on their on their roster that I like, you know, Benjamin. Um, so I, I like to see that Pac-12 matchup. Um, uh, Ohio State Nebraska is another game that I know I know Russ mentioned. I, I like to see how that goes. Uh, Adrian Martinez, the sophomore uh, quarterback from Nebraska, is a kid that really. Um, you know, last week he tore up the line. I threw for 327 yards and three touchdowns. I like yep. to see his progression, how he progresses um, versus a, a team as talented as Ohio State. Obviously, I'll, and on the flip side, I want to see um, the quarterback for Ohio State. Um, and I'm drawing a blank Justin here. Justin Fields. Um, thank you so much. Yes. So much. Justin Fields. Uh, he's really impressed me. And we talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, he's really impressed me. I knew he was a great athlete. I knew mm-hmm. he was a dual threat quarterback, ability to run, so on and so forth. I want to see him as a thrower, as a passer. And he's done that this year so far. He's th- shown me the ability to throw receivers open. He's shown a, a beautiful deep ball. Um, so I, I like to see guys who are predominantly known for for using their, their legs as their, as their main weapons be able to show an ability to to you know throw throw receivers open you know have have a feel for the passing game sure the field so far has shown me just that so i like to see that continue so that's another game i'll be looking into uh another pac-12 matchup is usc versus washington you know russ hit on jacob eason 
Yep. He's a quarterback that didn't make my initial top 10 list, but he's a guy that is, is on my radar now to, you know, one, once I update my list midway through the season, that's possibly going to, you know, work his way onto that list. So he's a kid. You know, imagine Georgia. They had Eason from, and last year they had uh, Fields. So yep. that, that's one trio, uh, a pretty good trio of quarterbacks on, on that on that one one team there. So uh, so that's a game I'm looking forward to. And then, of course, Virginia versus Notre Dame. Uh, you know, Notre Dame uh, played a, a tough game uh, versus um, Georgia last week. Uh, you know, I really I thought, you know, they had a chance to win that game. Uh, sure. Came up a little bit short. Uh, so I want to see how they bounce back. You know, uh, Virginia is 18th in, uh, currently in the nation. Uh, so, yep. you know, if, if they take them for granted, they could get – smoked you know uh you know and, and because it, th- there'll be a letdown you know because they went to georgia they thought they could win the game they lost you know close game yep. is there going to be a letdown and if there is a letdown virginia can you know beat Notre dame so that's a game i'm going to be keeping an eye on as well yeah your guy chase claypool on the season has 15 catches 256 yards and two touchdowns so uh <laughs> you know uh, he he made your your top 10 uh receiver list so uh, definitely a name to keep an eye on. Um, you know, any particular prospects? Uh, you know, maybe not in some of these games that that you're keeping a close eye on, Danny. Well, I mean, particularly like I said in the, in the Nebraska Ohio State game, I want to see Adrian Martinez. I wanna, I, he's a sophomore this year. I, I believe he's not a not draft eligible, but I want to see the progression of this quarterback, especially in Scott Frost's offense. You know, he's he got a lot of hype coming into the season. And he's he's a kid that that I think has some tool sets that that will intrigue a lot of NFL teams possibly next year. So uh, he's he's a guy who's a dual threat kid, you know kid. And like again, a lot of these quarterbacks now, you're looking, you know, the the trend now is is for these dual threat quarterbacks, guys mm-hmm. who can run the RPOs, guys who can use their legs to gain first downs, to keep drives alive. So he's he's another kid that I'm going to be looking hard at. Obviously, Chase Young has has really come out and he's dominated college football so far the defensive end from Ohio State he if I had a big board right now he's easily my, my top player in, in the draft so he's a guy I want to see him go up against that Nebraska offensive line um we talked about Easton already to Washington and, and you know yep. and, and Claypool and Russ hit on his Claypool versus Bryce Hall Hall is is a kid a cornerback that's very very underrated he's a kid that he will not run a 4-4 or 4-3-40 uh but he's a guy a kid who's got size is about six feet and uh, you know, we'll talk about him when I, when, I, when I do my top 10 list uh, on defense going on you know, in, in upcoming weeks. But yep. he's a kid who's got tremendous ball skills. And him, last year, him and Thornhill, the, the safety that got drafted by the Chiefs, those guys were all over the defensive backfield for Virginia. So uh, I, I, that matchup, Hall versus Claypool, is something that's going to be very intriguing for me. You know, both guys aren't burners per se. But both guys, you know how to use their size and their length to be able to make play. So, you know, who wins that battle? Hopefully they're matched up one on one multiple times, and but that's that's a matchup that I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to keeping an eye on. Awesome, Danny. Well, uh, I want to thank you for another great show. Uh, we want to thank our guest Russ Landy again for all his great insight. Uh, phenomenal uh, job from Russ tonight, and thank you to everyone who listened live and joined us in the Mixler chat. We hope you enjoyed this week's show. If you can't join us live, you can find the podcast version of Draft on Tap the, uh, usually uh, shortly right after the show or the next morning uh, if you're already in bed. Uh, thank you to Eldo Gandia for holding down the four for us tonight and his great work. Uh, as always, behind the board, and a big shout out to the voice of the barroom, Dan Aguirre, and everybody else at Bears Barroom who continue to make this network an amazing one. Join us next week for another episode of Draft on Tap. Good night, everybody. Hey, everybody, it's Aldo Gandia here. I know you like the podcast version of this show because you're still listening, but you might like the live version even more because you get to interact with fellow college football fans. So go over to Mixler.com, M-I-X-L-R.com, and register. It is totally free. You will get email updates as to when we are having live shows on the network, and then stop by whenever you can and interact with fellow fans. Mixler.com. Register. It is totally free. One last thing. If you are on Twitter, make sure you follow us there at Bears Barroom and Draft on Tap as its own account at Draft Tap. <laughs>